Tak, przed dolarną. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, uh, I thank Senator Rhiannon for bringing this bill forward, and it's entirely appropriate given what happened over the summer recess and the incredible series of indignities that the public has been exposed to. This is an incredibly important issue. We are all aware, no matter what side of politics we're in, but we're keenly aware of it up here on the crossbench, that public confidence in parliament, public confidence in parliamentarians is at an all-time low. Certainly since I've been working in this building for a little over 10 years, I have never known a time when contempt for the conduct of MPs at a state and federal level has been higher. And that is something that everybody who works in this building needs to bear a measure of responsibility for. And we are in um, the Australian Greens are aware that there are things that we can do that lead by example that can help restore a measure of confidence. One of those things that the Greens have been pursuing essentially for as long as we've been a political party is a national anti-corruption commission. I want to talk a little bit about the Western Australian context in a, moment, uh, in a moment, but firstly I want to go through a little bit of the history and remind senators of how long this issue has been running for. In 2010, Senator Bob Brown introduced a Greens National Integrity Commission bill. In 2012, a member for Melbourne, Adam Bann, introduced a similar bill into the House of Representatives. In 2013, Senator Christine Milne introduced a National Integrity Commission bill. In 2015, Senator Rhiannon introduced a motion calling for a national anti-corruption body and political donations reform, and I can remember sitting here uh, on the crossbench and having that motion voted down by the Labor Party and by the Liberal Party. If I, my memory serves me, a substantial number of crossbenchers supported the Greens and, of course, the major parties did not. In 2016, Senator Rhiannon again reintroduced a National Integrity Commission bill. How long is this debate going to need to run for? We have been prosecuting this case in here for more than a decade. The public support for a measure of this sort has never been higher. We are elected in here to represent the public interest, not to line our own pockets, not to set up future career paths in the mining industry or the banking sector or the gambling industry. We are here to serve the public interest. And uh, there will probably be a substantial number of people listening to this broadcast or checking in online who are choking over their coffee at the idea that that's what politicians come in here to do. What better way to begin to restore confidence in the work that is done in here than a National Anti-Corruption Commission? Um, I would take an interjection from Senator Rhiannon if she's able to remind me how many New South Wales politicians were eventually prosecuted or went to jail? Uh, very hard to count, but 11 Liberal MPs. 11 Liberal well, MPs. I will take that interjection, this, Senator Rhiannon. That is Rhiannon. a little bit disorderly and cheeky, Senator Ludlam. But interjections are disorderly. Senator Ludlam, you have the call. Order on my right. We, on my right. Hit a bit of a nerve, have we, Senator MacDonald? I've missed you so much. Yes, Order. that's right. To the through chair, you, Senator Ludlam. Through you, Mr President. Through me, not yes. through me. Yeah. Labor, senior Labor MPs, ministers. Senator MacDonald is quite right. There is mud on both sides. I don't actually believe any Greens MP at any level of parliament or local government, state or federal, has ever suffered the kind of indignity and accusations of corruptions that your side of politics, Senator Macdonald, and the Labor side of politics have been subjected to. Western Australia. Let's talk about Western Australia. If you order, order, Senator Macdonald and Senator Seward, order, order, Senator Seward. This, this order. Now, senators, if you wish to have a discussion about this across the chamber, leave the chamber and do it outside. Senator Ludlam has the call, and Senator Ludlam, you may continue. Thanks, President. Um, going, going to Western Australia, a little bit before my time in politics, but uh, WA Inc. is a name that probably lives on in infamy when the stench of corruption in the state 
uh, Labor government going back into the 1980s and 90s became impossible to ignore. Government was eventually rolled out of office on that basis. And what we see effectively at a state level, uh, and I would acknowledge that the practice of anti-corruption commissions at a state level is extremely uneven. Uh, there's not really consistency in the way that these commissions operate. But we know that a major missing piece of the architecture is that no such thing exists at a federal level. The Australian Greens proposal, uh, it's been on the hand side for more than 10 years if uh, senators would care to go back and analyse what it is that we've been proposing. But I will just remind senators. I'm sorry, Senator Collins. People, people are so rowdy this morning, President. Well, I don't know don't if I'm being unusually the provocative. Senator Ludlam, and senators don't interject. I'm doing my best here. The proposal that the Greens have put forward and that Senator Rhiannon has put on the notice paper today is effectively a threefold body. A Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner, so effectively taking the existing Law Enforcement Integrity Commission and rolling it into a body that will then incorporate a National Integrity Commissioner and an Independent Parliamentary Advisor. So the Independent Parliamentary Advisor, you would imagine, would be the sort of person who would advise before the fact rather than after on helicopter charters, for example, or trips to polo matches, or taxpayer-funded trips to weddings in India, or the various other disgraceful activities that MPs uh, in this building have eventually had their careers terminated, not through any kind of due process, uh, but effectively by public outrage. We saw it happen with the health minister over the summer break. Pat out your investment portfolio with spontaneous purchases of investment properties on the Gold Coast. Oh, brilliant idea. And then have the taxpayer pick up the tab for the flights and the com cars and whatever else. These are the sort of activities that MPs can avoid uh, finding themselves enmeshed in if you have an independent parliamentary advisor. I don't believe the helicopter charters from Miss Bishop or the taxpayer-funded uh, investment property splurge. I don't think those things are grey areas at all. But anybody who's spent any time in here would be aware that there are grey areas around the use of entitlements or the fact that they're even called entitlements at all. And all of us from time to time could use somebody, an independent umpire on the end of the phone line to ring up and say, I don't know about this. Is this within uh, the rules? or not. So an independent parliamentary advisor is a really important part of this. And the third body, obviously, is a national integrity commissioner. That is where the rubber hits the road. That is where you discover the kind of activities uh, that destroyed a Labor government in WA, that has so disfigured politics in New South Wales. I think probably all of us representing the states and territories around the country would be very well aware there's nowhere, no level of government that hasn't from time to time been tainted with a hint or a lot more than a hint of corruption. Why we would imagine, as the government senator, I forget exactly who it was, tried to put to us yesterday, that at a Commonwealth level, dealing uh, with enormous sums of money, very close contacts between uh, ministers and industry, diaries that aren't released into the public domain, why we would imagine uh, that at this tier of government we would be somehow magically immune. I think it's absolutely essential that this final, well not final piece, but important piece of architecture, of institutional architecture, a corruption oversight body looking after what goes on in this chamber and in the other place just across the building. I want to come to a couple of examples that are much closer to home. Um, and it was, it was rather extraordinary, uh, again, to hear a government spokesperson yesterday tell us we don't need a national uh, anti-corruption watchdog. It's better if this sort of thing is diffused throughout the public service. And the minister is effectively saying, we'd rather nobody was in charge. We'd rather there was nobody where the buck stopped to keep an eye and unearth corruption and to be able to take evidence and to be able to be the person where the buck stops. They'd rather that that was diffused and that it not really be anybody's responsibility. I don't know if it's the first time that that form of argument has been run, but I found it peculiar and entirely unconvincing. An example of where I think we could use this kind of body in the Western Australian context, you will be aware because Senator Seawitt and I have been raising this matter for many years. Uh, Senator Lyons has been raising it. Senator Stirl has been raising it. 
um, the matter of the Perth Freight Link, the so-called Row 8 extension, back in Western Australia. It was announced very suddenly by the Liberal government right before the 2013 federal election. It's one of these dead dogs of a policy of Tony Abbott, uh, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, um, that is still stinking the place up. There's West Connects, there's the East West Link, and there's Roe Highway. One of these kind of zombie policies, which are a tremendously expensive one that refuses to fall over. $1.2 billion of Australian people's taxpayers' money committed on a whim, effectively signed off on the back of an envelope by former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. No business case, no public cost benefit analysis, and the contract has been awarded, what do you know, by the state government, I should uh, say, not, not, the, not the Commonwealth, to a consortium of companies led by Leighton Holdings, uh, who I don't know if this was anything to do with brand damage, but they renamed themselves as CIMIC a little while ago. They're a massive donor to the Liberal Party. Leighton's have donated nearly $700,000 to the WA Liberal and National Parties. That buys a lot of TV time, doesn't it? That buys a lot of access. That buys a lot of quiet conversations. These old networks, private school networks, old boys clubs greased by a $700,000 political donation. All above board. Nothing illegal. $700,000 to the Liberal National Parties. So this is a corporation that is bidding for a massive government contract. So for your $700,000, entirely above board, you can go into bid for $1.2 billion engineering and construction contracts. It's a clear conflict of interest. No wonder trust in the institutions and that queasy interface between commerce and politics. No wonder trust is at an all-time low. We think that it's time to ban political donations from for-profit corporations. And I know that's going to cause a degree of hyperventilation from the other end of the chamber, because it's that money that helped put you here. But we think uh, that these things should be banned. Leighton's is a $6.3 billion company, and they run mining, construction, transport and engineering projects all around the globe. And it's been described as a company where corrupt practices were absolutely endemic. Highly paid senior executives used a range of bribery techniques, including kickbacks to subcontractors, special payments to procure contracts and facilitation payments. So while these bribery incidents occurred overseas, Leighton's involvement with Australian government funded projects has been questioned. Who would you put these kind of questions to? At the moment, there is nobody. There is nobody that you can put these kind of questions to. So Leighton's, as I said, they now operate under the name CIMIC after corruption allegations in 2013 came to light. So that's fine, just change the name. We don't know whether these practices have changed, whether the corporate culture has changed. We don't know whether these kind of activities are occurring under the table here in Australia, because there's nobody tasked to find out. In 2013, the Sydney Morning Herald reported building giant Leighton was rife with corruption. And they disclosed evidence of massive bribery and corruption in the way the contracts were being won around the world. Most notoriously, the multi-million dollar kickbacks paid to win Ira uh, contracts in Iraq which were later investigated by the Australian Federal Police. As recently as January 31st of this year, the Herald reported building giant Leighton rife with corruption. And I want to quote from that article. In revelations that will cause international embarrassment for Australia and raise questions about the role of the nation's corporate watchdog, the files expose plans to pay alleged multi-million dollar kickbacks in Iraq, Indonesia, Malaysia and elsewhere, along with other serious corporate misconduct. Hundreds of confidential company documents obtained during a six-month Fairfax media investigation also reveal a culture of rewarding corruption or incompetence and abysmal corporate governments in what looms as the worst recent case of corporate corruption involving a major Australian firm. So they can throw down $700,000 here in Australia and as if by magic through some black box tendering process that is shrouded in commercial inconfidence, this parliament hasn't been able to assess exactly why that contract was won or whether the contract represents value for money, they nailed down a $1.2 billion construction contract for a completely pointless road, freight highway, through an important wetland area, an area of enormous significance to Aboriginal people, an area of very high neighbourhood amenity, an area that has effectively been dubbed the King's Park of the South. For anybody from Western Australia will know that this is an area uh, of extraordinary biodiversity, of extraordinary value to the community, and it's being 
uh, torn in half effectively by this project. So I want to acknowledge Senator Rhiannon's work, and particularly in the Democracy for Sale site. And in many ways, our New South Wales colleagues were a bit ahead of the curve, presumably because uh, politics there, um, knowing a little bit about the way that, new, that politics has worked in New South Wales in the past, uh, it's, it's been essential that the New South Wales Greens have held the major parties to account, partly because the institutions haven't really been there to do it, and the Greens have been a really important part in New South Wales and elsewhere around the country of holding the major parties to account and trying to throw some sunlight on that interface between corporations and commerce and the political tier. This weekend, uh, the launch of, our, of the uh, Greens WA state election campaign is underway, and I'm very proud to foreshadow an announcement that my colleagues will be making on integrity in government. Because in WA, we know that vested interest groups and wealthy power brokers have been able to undermine and influence our democratic system. And it's one of the reasons that people are fleeing the major parties in droves, including your party, Senator MacDonald. I don't know whether you've snoozed through that part of the memo, uh, but you lot are really on the nose. And confidence in government, confidence in the Liberal National parties is at an all-time low. For example, the aggressive attack that the mining lobby has thrown into the field against the proposal to increase royalties in Western Australia. The mining industry wields extraordinary power. We saw that with the way that they damaged and ultimately destroyed uh, Kevin Rudd's prime ministership, former prime minister Kevin Rudd. And meanwhile, the same government is abusing freedom of information requests. They hide behind commercial and confidence excuses to keep these slimy deals that they make out of the public eye. The Greens believe that a resilient democracy depends on all levels of government being transparent in how these decisions are made. That includes this tier of government. I am looking forward when coalition spokespeople stand up to tell us why there's nothing to see here, why they don't feel the need for an anti-corruption watchdog at a Commonwealth level. I'm really looking forward to that. Please go ahead, those on the coalition side, because I understand after 20 years of campaigning by the Australian Greens, the Labor Party may, like that oil tanker at sea, that ship may slowly be turning. The coalition side, I remember when we were debating mandatory data retention, being told if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. You remember that? Anybody complaining about overwhelmingly intrusive government surveillance is told if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. I think at a personal level, as far as personal privacy is concerned, that argument is completely hollow. But in terms of powerful institutions, in terms of governments writing cheques for billions of dollars at a time to their mates in the construction industry, to oil and gas companies, to engineering companies, to developers, what is it that you have to fear? Because I'm reasonably sure that when you stand up and try to run counter-arguments to this incredibly sensible and long-standing proposal by Senator Rhiannon, you're going to tell us that you have nothing to hide. Well then, let's see. Let's get these cards on the table. Let's have a, na a national anti-corruption watchdog to do the kind of job that has been done in New South Wales and has done so much good, not necessarily to restore confidence in politics and the rule of law, but at least to raise the bar to corruption, to increase transparency so that people doing these slimy deals behind closed doors are aware that there may be some consequences. It's about time that those consequences fell due at a Commonwealth level. Thanks, Senator.